left, Oros was in the center, and Rivera is on the right. Chronologically, of course, Oros was the oldest, followed by Rivera, and Siqueiros was the youngest. Orozco. From an initial identification with the anarcho-syndicalism of the Casa del Obrero Mundial, in time he shifted to a belief in anarchist individualism whose critical reading of social conflict was grounded in his disillusionment with the failures of the Mexican Revolution. His style, from his early block-like neoclassicism, as you see in these wonderful examples from the Preparatoria Nacional, uh, the trench, and revolutionary trinity. So we see his style from its early block-like neoclassicism of the earlier images to an evolving vocabulary becomes more and more expressionistic. Here we have wonderful examples from the Baker Library <coughs> up at Dartmouth College. Uh, and here you really see Orozco's worldview uh, crystallized. I mean, you see the panel Hispanoamerica on the upper left. Uh, and Slightly to the left of that, you see a little bit of his view of New England democracy with this rather severe, uh, no offense intended, very Protestant looking lady from New England, right? Uh, and then, of course, Latin America is represented by a Zapatista like uh, a guerrilla fighter being attacked uh, by the power structure. Look how his color has become much more intense and brighter, right? The other image, stillborn education, I think should be a poster that all academics have in their offices so that we <laughs> keep clearing our mind from cobwebs and remembering that our job is to help in the educational process, not to become sort of professors by rote and mechanical repetition. So we see his evolution then getting to a late, uh, almost ecstatic kind of expressionism, which really elucidates his vision of disillusionment. Here, of course, examples from Catarsis. And really in the National Palace of Fine Arts and the extraordinary dome, dome at the uh, Hospicio Cabañas in Guadalajara. If political agency is possible for Orozco, this agency exists only in painting itself. <coughs> Rivera. His ultra leftist Marxist spirit was also that of his most innovative mural work from the late 1920s to the end of the 1930s. This is the period when we see most clearly the transcultural modernity that he comes up with, a synthesis of Cubist composition, classical linear clarity, and bright palette, all used to construct a life-affirming vision of inevitable revolution. Here, of course, wonderful examples from his first mural creation uh, at the Preparatoria, and then a couple of panels from the Secretaria de Educación Pública. From 1941 until his death in 1957, Rivera's painting starts to become anecdotal and sentimental in content, and you could argue repetitive in form. But here we're still seeing him at the top of his form. An example from the Detroit Industry murals on the left, and the central panel of the recreated Rockefeller Center mural that, of course, is now at the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico City. <laughs> the wonderful man of the crossroads with the representation of Lenin, which, of course, was what made Nelson Rockefeller have the mural destroyed in 1933. This change in his style, which becomes, as we see in this later work, more anecdotal, more sentimental, uh, repetitive in form, losing some of that intense uh, transcultural modernity of the first couple of decades, does coincide with his pilgrimage back into the fold of the Mexican Communist Party and his eventual re-embrace uh, of the party and embrace of Stalinism, a Stalinism that, of course, many of you know, he had repudiated decades earlier when he had been a great supporter of Leon Trotsky. Siqueiros. There is a fascinating disconnection between the bold formal experimentation that we see in Siqueiros' work from the 20s, the 30s, and into the 40s, and a politics that over time becomes more and more dependent on a Leninist Stalinist line provided by the Mexican Communist Party. And what is fascinating about that disconnection is that Siqueiros is actually an artist that very early on in the 30s criticizes the socialist realism uh, being promoted by the Soviet Union. 
And he does this grounded in one of the most extraordinary experimental work that's done both in easel painting and in murals. Uh, here we see uh, two uh, examples of fragments also from the Preparatoria Nacional. And of course, what I consider to be one of his greatest works, and it's the work that he did with a team of artists, uh, which by the way is, is the chapter that Jennifer uh, contributed to the book. And don't buy the book just for my sake, buy it to read Jennifer's chapter. His pictorial achievements occur despite his at times crude and sometimes simplistic and particularly towards the end of his life, sometimes opportunistic version of Marxism. A version of politics that had, in an earlier incarnation, made his art so vital and dynamic, started to infect his art. And I would argue that it begins to deteriorate it to the point of self-parody during the last couple of decades of his life. Now here, I still think there's something visually fascinating going on, but by the time we get to this final mural project, uh, there's some issues here, not just in terms of what has happened to the form and the content, but also the whole patronage process of this particular mural project is uh, problematic. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit, maybe, well, right now on opportunistic that we support? Or how do you Why don't we elaborate on that afterwards when we have the questions? Okay, thanks. Of course, Los Tres Grandes were not the only artists who created and participated in the Mexican mural movement during its foundational and most radical years. Fernando Leal, Fermín Revueltas, Jean Charlot, and Ramón Alba de la Canal were part of this generation. And their murals in the Escuela Nacional Preparatoria during the years 1923 to 24 attest to the stylistic diversity of muralism and the crossroads where the avant-garde nationalism and audience met. And here we have wonderful examples by Leal's The Feast of Our Lord of Chama, Charlot's Massacre at the Templo Mayor, Alba de Canal's uh, The Arrival of the Cross, and Fermín Revuelta's uh, Virgin of Guadalupe. A significant component of the history of Mexican muralism is also the reaction against it. By the end of the 1920s, we see this in the work of painters associated with the magazine Contemporaneos. Rufino Tamayo, Manuel Rodriguez Lozano, here we have some two wonderful examples, and in particular the Lozano portrait of the poet and essayist uh, Salvador Novo, I think it's a terrific uh, portrait. The always extraordinary Marie Izquierdo and Agustin Lasso, among many, produced a body of work that aesthetically rejected the social historical model of the muralist. In the words of my colleague Robin Greeley, for the contemporaneo painters, and I quote, Mexico's crisis of modernity, unlike that of Europe, was not the terror of the new unhinged from the past, but rather the pathological resurgence of the ancient in the guise of the modern, end of quote. The hemispheric impact of Mexican realism was felt from the north to the south, clearly evident in the WPA program in the United States, here are examples of uh, Zach Heim and the wonderful New Jersey Homesteads mural by Ben Sean. That's in my home state of New Jersey. The murals and easel pictures of Brazil's Candido Portinari, the powerful serial work by Ecuador's Osvaldo Guayasamin, the alternative muralism of the always critical and inventive Antonio Verni in Argentina, and even a handful of easel paintings by Cuba's Mario Carreño, to name the most original and interesting cases. By the 1940s, with a handful of exceptions, the second and third generation of murals settled comfortably into painting images that served, in a sense, the national myth of Mexico, as represented by the bourgeois bureaucratic policies of the Mexican state. This lucid analysis was first stated by the Marxist novelist Jose Revueltas, in his 1967 article, Escuela Mexicana de Pintura y Novela de la Revolución. Revueltas took to task both Rivera and Siqueiros, as well as their less talented followers, blaming them for the self-alienation, lack of authenticity, and mythification of the mural movement. Revuelta believed that Siqueiros and Rivera's political and artistic differences dissolved because their murals functioned as ideological fetishes and deformed concepts of the national myth of Mexico, which ultimately 
ended up serving the policies of the post-revolutionary PRI state. During the Cold War, the significant presence of the Mexican muralists was whitewashed or erased from the narrative of modern art to the point of ignoring the direct connections of muralism to the work of abstract expressionist painters like Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko. Pollock, of course, not only saw Orozco paint the New School murals, he was a student of Thomas R. Benton, but he worked closely with Cicados in 1936 in the experimental uh, workshop in New York. And as I always tell my undergraduate students who have seen the Ed Harris Pollock movie, where he shows this sort of moment of eureka where Pollock picks up a brush and paint drips, and he just looks all enlightened, and I say, that is an outright lie. Pollock learned to drip with Cicados in 1936. Cicados was working on the floor using all kinds of non-traditional materials, uh, and in essence, using the accidents of his pourings to then develop his imagery. Mark Rothko, of course, uh, is listed as an assistant to Leo Rivera in the execution of the Rockefeller Center mural, <coughs> except that he's listed with his original name, Marcus Rothkowitz. Uh, very few uh, of the, the early literature uh, on Rothko mentions this connection, but Rothko's idea of monumentality and also this sense of engaging with something substantial, uh, at times difficult, with the public in terms of the content is definitely connected uh, to his apprenticeship with Rivera. By the late 1970s and early 1980s, the tide was already turning. And the past 30 years have seen a serious and steady output of substantial scholarship, as well as many exhibitions, even when many of them have been problematic, such as you know, the, 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 big, you know, the massive show at the Met of Mexico, Splendor of 30 Centuries, which was something of a mega show with a lot of decontextualization of the work, and a lot of historical narratives being presented. And yet, the resurgence of the critical spirit of early muralism has been seen in the community murals of the Chicano artists, for example, on the lower left, by Carlos Amarras, and the Arte Acá collected in the Martel neighborhood of Tepito in Mexico City, as an example, on the upper left, from 1972 to the present, as well as in the Mantas by the Ojos de Lucha Collective, uh, which you are seeing over on the right, I would also argue that the spiritual, conceptual descendants of what is most innovative formally and radical in terms of content in Mexican muralism can be found today in the work of Latino artists who live and work in the United States, such as the Chicano artist Rupert Garcia, the Cuban-American Luis Cruz Casaceta, and the always extraordinarily Eurican painter Juan Sanchez. Beyond the mythology of Los Tres Grandes, beyond the co-opting of the imagery of muralism by the post-revolutionary Mexican state, the visual legacy of Orozco, Rivera, Siqueiros, and others remains one of the great adventures of modernism, a fragmented, paradoxical modernism charged with both utopian belief and disillusionment, where monumental, figural, visual vocabularies at their best both reflected and critique the historical experience of Mexico. Thank you. Uh, and as I said uh, earlier, we'll reserve our questions until we've had both speakers, and then we'll uh, move on. Our, our second speaker is uh, Jennifer Jolie, who is an associate professor in the Department of Art History at Ithaca College. She researches the intersection of art and politics in modern Mexico. She specializes in the work of the Mexican muralists. Her broader research interests include understanding the muralists within the context of international politics of the 1930s, the intersection of art and technology, and the regional dissemination of Mexican muralism. Her current project uh, investigates the art, murals, sculpture, and ardenas in Michoacan, uh, Mexico, as part of a program of tourism development and national integration. Uh, her articles have appeared in Oxford Art Journal, Kunst und Politik, and others. Jennifer? All right, thank you so much um, to the Bildner Center for this opportunity. And it's particularly nice to do, give this talk um, along with Alejandro's talk because the thing that I think we're missing in our, our earlier publication is a look at regional Mexico. And so it's, I think this is a perfect 
opportunity. <clears throat> So, in 1936, the Mexican tourism magazine MAPA noted in its discussion of Pátzcuaro's recent revitalization that, quote, the foreigner who visits Pátzcuaro cannot return without a profound sympathy for Mexico. The Mexican who visits this town understands the depth of his nationality, a trajectory that continues tacitly for a succession of generations to affirm a country with character, with its own soul, loyal to our lands and to our blood. The journal goes on to credit President Lázaro Cárdenas with supporting the kind of development that could allow Pat tourism in Pátzcuaro to accomplish this lofty work of national integration and international diplomacy. Such dedication to Pátzcuaro's development began when Cárdenas was governor of Michoacán. Between 1931 and 1940, he funded a range of cultural and infrastructural projects to support local populations and the emerging tourism industry, from new buildings and sculptural monuments to the restoration of historic structures, the founding of a new museum dedicated to popular arts, and the creation of a series of scenic overlooks around the lake from which visitors could enjoy the region's natural splendor. He also commissioned artists from Mexico City to paint murals, celebrating the history, culture, and development of the region. And in a larger book project that I'm working on, I, I really argue that um, Pátzcuaro was really arguably the center of and, and the most coherent projection of um, Lázaro Cárdenas's cultural policy. Pátzcuaro's murals performed a key role within this program of national integration largely by engaging both um, content and modes of seeing increasingly associated with local tourism. While it is perhaps not surprising that the muralist's content regularly referred to the region's distinctive history, folkloric cultural practices, artisanias, and natural beauty, it is their most hand in hand with, uh, with other emerging sightseeing rituals as a kind of technology of nationalism like virtual reality devices. They promote a particular way of seeing from above and a means of organizing the lake region as a whole, which had the potential to contribute to national integration in a highly unstable region of Mexico. Such vantages, I'll argue, also project an interesting range of ideal viewers and suggest that learning to see like a tourist could do important political work for locals and visitors alike. To understand the significance of this departure from purely picturesque representations of Lake Pátzcuaro, first we must establish the function of the picturesque. When scientist and explorer Alexander von Humboldt referred to Pátzcuaro as one of the most picturesque lakes in the world, he further developed a notion of Pátzcuaro as an unchanging, ideal, Eden-like foil for the tumultuous, uncontrollable forces of transformation unleashed by the newly created Jarullo volcano. His opposition of this latter-day Eden populated by Mexico's ideal indigenous race, the Tarascans, with the awe-inspiring power of volcanic Michoacán, is a structure repeated in the painting of various travel artists. So for, for example, here, um, Johan Maurice Rogendas, who painted a picturesque, accessible image of the shores of Lake Pátzcuaro, which contrasted with the sublime images from other parts of Michoacán. Such images of Pátzcuaro as an unchanging Eden continued through the 20th century. Their standard in the work of Hugo Brema, whose images of the lake's fishermen appeared regularly in the pages of tourism magazines, promoting travel to Pátzcuaro for urban middle classes. And yet when the muralists of the 1930s begin to treat the subject of Lake Pátzcuaro, they relocate us to a vantage high above the lake, at times creating bizarre distortions of perspective to present picturesque and folkloric characters seen at eye level with views of the lake seen from above. For example, in Roberto Cueva del Rio's mural promoting the local Secretary of Public Education's programs that decorates the theater at the center of Cardenas' Pátzcuaro revitalization project. And this is the um, Teatro Emperador Capsozin, which was constructed by um, Alberto Leduc and opened in 1937 on the site of a former Augustinian monastery. So how should we understand such an explicit rethinking of the use of perspective to represent Lake Pátzcuaro? 
I suggest that it is particularly the distinctive semiotics of the form of muralism itself, conceived during this period as a collective and national art form, and, and partially the result of a new engagement with tourism and its practices. As sociologist John Uri describes in The Tourist Gaze, both practices and visual technologies of tourism have worked to develop, have worked Sorry. have worked to help structure ways of seeing in historically and culturally specific ways. I will draw attention today to muralist engagement with three touristic modes of seeing, maps, scenic overlooks, and aerial views. Of course, as literary historian James Buzzard describes, going hand in hand with the rise of tourism was also an anti-touristic sentiment, a sentiment I'd describe as really instrumental in visiting artists' critique of the picturesque and introduction of new modernist ways of seeing the region. Thus, while I will suggest that there are a range of aesthetics to be found in these views from on high developed in Pascuaro's murals, they ultimately all work together to encourage viewers to conceive of themselves and the world around them as part of a larger unified whole. Given the close association between the picturesque and tourism, it should not surprise us that a range of modernist artists and intellectuals typically negotiated their ambivalence towards tourism in anti-picturesque aesthetic terms. As the ritual of travel became a key part of artistic and intellectual identity in Mexico, as experiencing and appropriating regional Mexico became part of defining Mexicanidad, Artists simultaneously work to distance themselves from the commercial associations of tourism. Thus, performances of um, Genizio by Silvestre Revueltas, for example, are still typically prefaced with his disavowal of the picturesque and, and a sarcastic embrace of tourism. He writes, for example, um, Genizio is a small island on Lake Pátzcuaro. The lake is dirty. Travelers looking for romantic sensations have beautified it with phrases fit for postcards and light music. To take advantage of this, I chipped in as well. Posterity will surely award me a prize for this contribution to touristic commerce. Um, and more directly for our purposes, we might recall Edward Weston and Tina Medotti's deep discomfort for being taken for tourists when they were working for Anita Brenner, taking photographs on the island of Henizio in Lake Pazcuaro in 1926. Weston wrote that he was irritated by the picturesque and created a photograph from Henizio, in the upper corner there, um, that, that has come to really epitomize anti-picturesque photography in its flattening of space and bands of light and dark patterning. This anti-picturesque modernism is the key point of reference for making sense of the bizarre distortion of perspective in Robert, Roberto Cueva del Rio's mural for Pascuaro's new public theater, the centerpiece of Garnes' project. Cueva del Rio surrounds the theater's audience with a flat, frieze-like cluster of figures representing the Secretary of Public Education's literacy and cultural programs for the region, including images associated with the regional picturesque, Los Viejitos, La Danza de los Morros, The Lacquered Gourds, and other artesanías. And here, they're all transformed into iconic symbols, much like um, Carlos Merida's fisherman lithograph that I'm showing you here. Even more extreme in its visual flattening than Weston, Cueva del Rio removes the horizon line altogether, which simultaneously raises us up higher, high over the scene, even as it immerses the lake's diverse cultures, its islands, its boat and wildlife, not to mention the audience itself within the whole of the composition. And to fully experience that, you need to be in the space where you're literally absolutely surrounded by pure lake and all these symbols. The visual unification accomplished by such perspectival distortion was ideologically loaded and positions this mural as just one part of a much larger attempt by Gardenas to consolidate Lake Pátzcuaro as a unit. During this period, the communities around the lake were sharply divided by ideology, tensions between those who supported land redistribution and secular education and those who had sided with the Cristeros remained charged even after the ostensible end of the Cristeros Rebellion in 1929. So this was a, a, a very tense and divided region. Um, yet state investment in the ecological study of the lake as a closed system, in histories of the lake, um, emphasizing periods of unity, 
and in infrastructural development, creating a network of roads surrounding the lake. All of these worked hand in hand with um, the series of murals I'll show you today, today to define this region as a coherent whole. As such, Cueva del, Ro, mur, oh, sorry, Cueva del Rio's mural and his way of seeing Lake Pazuero were emblematic of Cardenas' cultural project in this region. The expansion of the local tourism industry in the 1930s provided another means to reimagine the lake region as a unit. And the visual um, culture and practices of tourism, including maps, were key. The rise of tourism in Pátzcuaro prompted the creation of a range of regional maps available both independently and as part of regional guides and historical studies. Maps oriented their viewers, and further, their systematic organization allowed viewers to conceive of the region as a whole, despite those political and religious tensions that sharply divided local communities and continued to threaten national unity. The anonymous mural depicting pre-conquest Lake Pátzcuaro, found alongside a room of images showing Tarascan life from pre- to and post-conquest world, which are all now part of a Pemex station includes a wall dedicated to presenting a bird's eye view of the lake to embody this ideal of regional unity. Its compass and glyph-like birds, houses, and boats evoke contemporary pictorial maps, like that produced for um, Yusino Fernandez's 1936 Pazuaro guidebook. However, his map orients us to the town of Pazuaro, and the lake is limited to its re representation within Pazuaro's shield, which you can see there in greater detail. Instead, the mural is even more evocative of colonial representations of the lake, from Fray Paolo de Beaumont's colonial era map of the region from the 16th century to the shield of Pazcuaro. Such images would have been made in the spirit of consolidating or contesting local colonial power in this lake district, and once again reinforce ideological potential of this mural to speak to the ideal of regional coherence and ultimately national integration. During the 1930s, at least four scenic overlooks, or miradores, were constructed around Lake Pazuaro. Funded by the state of Michoacan and constructed by the army, the miradores formed a key part of the region's growing tourism infrastructure by providing a series of destinations around the lake from which one could enjoy sweeping panoramic vistas. As one guidebook described the lookout on El Estribo, quote, it is a rustic spot where you will really rest and the views of the lake will widen your eyes in wonder language clearly evoking the awe-inspiring power of the sublime. Such an experience, as Victor Serge describes in an account of his ascent to the summit of Henizio in the center of Lake Pazuaro, promotes a profound, quote, communing with terrestrial spaces, for all contemplation implies an identification with what is beheld. Thus, the Miradores worked to inscribe the nationalist and diplomatic work performed by sublime 19th century landscape paintings. And here we might think of um, Jose Maria Velasco's nationalistic landscapes that circulated abroad in international expositions and as diplomatic gifts. And they, they take these views and, um, and, ins and inscribe them into the experience of actual landscapes now available as tourism sightseeing rituals. At the same time, such panoramic vistas have also been connected to the idea of a mastering eye, or the monarch of all I survey, a literary trope that Mary Louise Pratt identifies within the rhetoric of 19th century travel writing, and which is arguably present, present in sublime landscape imagery as well. This tension in the tradition of thinking about the sublime experience between the viewer's submission of the self to the whole and the mastering view from above come together in a local historical anecdote. While out hunting, the Tarascan prince Curatame steps out onto a rock outcropping and was said to be awestruck at the sight of the lake and the islands below him. Soon afterwards, we're told that Curatame ruled over a peaceful Tarascan empire in large part because his reputation as a fierce warrior was so great. Such a narrative connects being awed by the lake and dominating the lake re region. This, a dualistic experience now offered tourists as they explore the lake. Both the new miradores 
and the um, murals that reinforce their views um, reinforce their association with the region's indigenous history and culture. In 1936, the state of Michoacan built the Tariyakuri Mirador, named after the first Tarascan ruler, and located on a site associated with him, El Estribo Volcano, beyond the colonial church El Cavario, where his remains were housed. While previous generations of travelers had admired their view from El Cavario, the new Tariyakuri Mirador allowed its viewers a virtual indigenous view of the lake. Roberto um, Gueva del Rio quotes this view in Pazcuaro's Teatro Emperador Catuzin, where it becomes the setting for the encounter of King Canoshuan II and Chris Cristobal de Alid um, in the environs of Pazcuaro in 1522. While this imagined encounter had been immortalized in a number of works from the 1930s, in a mural by Revueltas in Cardenas' estate in Pazcuaro, in a bronze relief panel, at, in a, a sculpture by uh, Guillermo Ruiz, um, Cuevas del Rio here strategically relocates the event from what is more typically in a ceremonial location and relocates it to El Estribo this site that's historically associated with both indigenous and colonial authority. A third mural in the new public theater also prevents, presents a view of Lake Pascuaro from on high as an ideologically loaded setting for local culture. And the use of this particular vista drives home the significance of such views. Ricardo Barcenas's 1937 mural, Industrias de Michoacán, presents a virtual marketplace high above Lake Pascuaro. The representation of regional artesanías pay, uh, pays homage to their, historically, their historical and contemporary role within the local economy, as well as the idea of, promoted by the Secretaria de Educación and institutionalized with the creation of a Museum of Popular Arts in Pascuaro in 1936. Basically, the idea that artesanías represented an authentic spiritual and aesthetic manifestation of indigenous Mexico. Parsinas perhaps read Alfonso Mayefer's recently published book, La Danza de Michoacán, as part of his visits to Pazcuaro, as the mural imagery is closely linked to Mayefer's impressionistic description of viewing the lake. He writes, quote, from a window as we write these pages, we see the lake and some blue mountains and think about Don Vasco, about Don Vasco who, and I should say, Don Vasco is the the first bishop of Michoacan, and the bishopric was originally in, um, in, in Pazcuaro. Okay, so we're in a, it's at the window thinking about Don Vasco. About Don Vasco, who ran all over the diocese on his white mule. About Don Vasco, who ran around the villages to watch and advise the artesanos who carve the wood, paint the platters, polish and decorate vases, and who have been doing these things that he taught them, and that fill them still with the fervor of life and love of artesanías, the tangi, or the traditional market, of the Michoacan people. Now, the question that this raises for my argument, however, is to whom does this window view belong? Notably, this view of Lake Pazcuaro and the island of Venizio is closely connected to the view from La Quinta Errendira, Cardenas, Lazaro Cardenas' estate in Pazcuaro. Um, although the mural vantage is higher than what you can see from Cardenas' house, Yet above and behind the estate is Cerro Colorado, and that was the site of yet another new, newly constructed mirador. So you can, you can see the hill beyond, the, beyond his estate, and that's where I'm taking you now. This mirador, El Estribito, was likely designed by architect Alberto Leduc, who specialized in neocolonial architecture and who oversaw many of Cardenas' projects in this region. The site includes multiple pavilions, multi-tiered platforms, and Baroque decorative uh, accents. The main pavilion includes two folkloric-themed murals by Cueva del Rio and is said to have originally housed a market. Originally designed to offer views in multiple de de directions, this once deforested site is now quite overgrown. Can't see much of anything <laughs> anymore. Um, and as you can see by the mural, it's in horrible condition. So it's, it's totally neglected now. Yet in imagining its original grandeur, we might ask, 
Whether this mirador represents a democratizing effort, wherein the view from the president's house is replicated and yet superseded by a public view and by Barcenas's mural. Thus we are presented with a new modern body politic, wherein the viewer, a local, a middle class tourist, a visiting diplomat, is aligned with the president's point of view and invited to be one with the land of Mexico. The final touristic motive seen I'd like to consider in relationship to these murals is that of aviation, which is arguably key to understanding the sublime view of Michoacan landscape and history in Juan O'Gorman's mural, La Historia de Michoacan, painted in 1941-42, in the then recently inaugurated Biblioteca Gertrudis Negra, which was housed in the former San Augustin Monastery, uh, church, next to the, what used to be the monastery. <coughs> Here, O'Gorman presents us with a panoramic parade of historical figures tying Michoacan history and legend to the ge geography of the region, from the legendary creation of lakes and volcanoes, through the region's indigenous history, the conquest, and independence and revolutionary periods. This historical panorama becomes the visual equivalent to the idea found repeatedly in touristic literature that Michoacan is an ideal destination for tourists within Mexico because it is rich in natural splendor and history from all of Mexico's historical periods. And that idea is repeated over and over again, that you can get pre-conquest Mexico, colonial Mexico, and modern Mexico all in one trip. Again, however, it's this conflation of modes of viewing that I want to draw attention to. While the figures from the colonial and modern periods are presented as if at ground level in front of us, we are also virtually suspended high above the region, looking at the lake from the north. While there was a mirador at the, end, at the northern end of the lake, and you can see the volcano that's on our side of the lake, that was um, the Sandino Hill above the town of San Gregorio. Um, yet we here, this time, we're soaring high above it, so clearly we're not just at a mirador. Aerial views have gained popularity in the 1930s, especially in the context of tourism. Anita Brenner, in Your Mexican Holiday, advised American tourists that the most spectacular mode of arrival in Mexico was to fly. And her text once again deploys the dualistic notion of the sublime, as the view provides the viewer both clarity and order, as well as awe-inspiring grandeur. The tour tourist magazine MAPA published articles on air travel illustrated with aerial photography. And the Compañía Aerofoto Mexicana, formed in 1930, shot images throughout the country, including these views of Pátzcuaro and its lake, to facilitate knowledge of Mexico's national territory and for the purposes of infrastructural development. Aerial views were also mobilized in the popular pictorial maps common to this period. Perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that it's Juan O'Gorman who gives us, um, who takes these views of Pátzcuaro to this new extreme. In his autobiography, he discusses his early fascination with views from on high, and in 1937, he painted his infamous murals for the Mexico City airport. In Pátzcuaro, O'Gorman deploys his panoramic aerial approach to sublime effect, like the maps and the views from <coughs> From Mirador's, La Historia de Michoacán presents history and geography as an all-encompassing whole. He lifts the viewer, tourist, and local li library patron alike up and out of the region to help him or her organize and know local history and potentially identify with it. Unless, of course, we choose to turn away like his wife, Helen Fowler. It's such a bizarre image because she's the one figure who just absolutely turning away from the entire scene. So that, that idea of point of view, I think, is very much embedded in, in this imagery. In conclusion, we must return to the ideological work performed by the set of views on high, both real and virtual. These touristic modes of seeing Pátzcuaro via la maps, miradores, and even airplanes were strategically conceived to align with ideologically loaded perspectives the president's view, an indigenous view, an outsider's aerial view. 
Such views from on high presented both the opportunity for identification with and contemplation of the history, culture, and land of Mexico, at the same time that they provided a commanding, authority-laden view. Thus, they remind us that while tourism was promoted as an activity that would transform the tourist into a more nat nationalistic Mexican or a foreign friend of Mexico, tourists also exercised what Dennis Merrill has called soft power in the region. In particular, a number of local communities that had rejected the Cardenista land redistribution on religious and ideological grounds became particularly dependent on tourism economies. So in short, the tourism industry was aligned with a larger project of social pacification and integration, working hand in hand with nationalist rhetoric and images. Pazcuaro's murals presenting this tourism-inspired view from on high exhibit a range of aesthetic effects. While O'Gorman and Cuevo del Rio um, arguably exploit a disembodied sublime to full effect, the other muralists work to ground their particular view from on high. Ultimately, I suggest that the artists drew on their own participation in touristic rituals in Michoacan, reading travel guides, visiting local sites, to code the experiences and ideology of touristic points of view into their murals. In doing so, they implicitly acknowledge parallels between tourism and muralism. Both promote collective forms of seeing, ideal for the project of national integration. In this sense, it shouldn't surprise us that similar views from on high will continue to be deployed in later murals as well as in films. Um, which are, of course, another mass art form, so another collective form. And the examples I'm showing you here are a later mural by O'Gorman, um, the, the idea that credit transforms Mexico from the 60s, um, and half of the mural is dedicated to this image on high of Lake Pazcuaro. Um, Cantu does a mural, The Riders of the Apocalypse, and this is, again, a study for that. Again, one, one of these aerial views of Lake Pazcuaro. And the, the wonderful... Um, Maria Felix movie of Maclovia um, by Elindio Fernandez um, is promoted with these images of Pascuaro from on high. And you can see the opus, uh, frame from the opening, opening sequence of the film um, shot by Figueroa. Um, again, another view from El Estribo that I showed you earlier. Ultimately, though, what I want to end with here then is this idea that this engagement with touristic modes of vision and the resulting rhetoric of this view from on high helped further consolidate the association between muralism and the state project of revolutionary nationalism. Thank you. Sir? Are these murals funded by the Mexican government? Who, who funds all this artistic work? That I've just shown you. Um, all of them except the O'Gorman is funded by Cardenas and through the federal government. So all the murals are federal government ones except for the O'Gorman mural. The O'Gorman mural is an interesting case. That's actually funded by uh, Kaufman. Uh, <laughs> a, in Pittsburgh, he owned a major department store and he had hired O'Gorman to come to the United States and paint a mural in the United States. His mural plans are rejected. Ultimately, um, and the money instead is, going, is used to fund some mural in Mexico. Um, what Orgorman proposes is way too political, so Kaufman sends him back to Mexico with money to, to put a mural somewhere. And O'Gorman works with Cardenas and works with the Secretary of Public Education in the early 40s. And this is notable because Cardenas is no longer president at this point. But still, he's the one, if you want to do murals in Pazcuaro, he's still the one you have to talk to, <laughs> clearly. So O'Gorman works with Cardenas and the, the then Secretary of Public Education and does the mural in the library. And the library was a Cardenas project, um, the restoration of that old church. And then, yeah, sir. I was just wondering if there was anything, I, I kind of have a vague memory of uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs having a similar conversation of optimizing the perspective based on what they deemed was the most beautiful, the most powerful, especially within figurative rendering. So that's why the profile was shown and then the body was turned forward and the lake sideways so that you could see the body at what they deemed was each ideal angle for those things. And I was just wondering how if there was any connection at all to this kind of nationalistic sentiment 
being in this ideal perspective of multiple, of, of collaging perspectives, I guess, to, to display a narrative? I would say there is a connection in the sense that each period of art has their particular set of conventions that have their own particular loaded meanings associated with them, right? And so that kind of configuration of an ideal in one cultural context is absolutely historically grounded and historically specific. And likewise, I think when we're talking about this view from on high, I mean, all of these artists are on one hand negotiating previous histories of art, um, so they're certainly aware of lots of different conventions. But they're, they're, I would say, as, as I'm arguing here, there's sort of two conventions in particular they're negotiating. On one hand, this rise of modernist um, conventions, this flattening, um, and, you, and you see that in earlier murals by Rivera, um, where his influence of cubism, which you know, sort of flattens everything onto the, onto the two-dimensional surface. That kind of approach is, is very much present here. But at the same time, I think, in this case of Pascual, as I'm arguing, these new, very historically specific new ways of seeing associated with tourism are being embedded into these works. And so in that sense, again, the idea that seeing, the idea that um, conventions of representation are historically specific is very parallel to what you're describing. Yeah, sir. The, 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 yeah. Yes, uh, this question is from Professor Andreos. Um, I'd like to hear what you have to say about um, how the uh, Siqueiros, Orozco, the Rivera um, <coughs> articulated the um, ideals of the Mexican, Mexican Revolution with socialism. And when I mean socialism, I mean how it was spreading in the 1920s, mm -hmm. and it spread parallel, parallel to Eurozim. Uh So how how were, uh, did they reconcile or not uh, these two ideals on, on, on the murals in the 20s? See, I would argue that throughout the 20s and throughout the 30s, they definitely are able to, maybe not before. Yeah. Sorry. I would argue that throughout the 20s and 30s, if not reconciled, they're able to do a kind of, of syncretic synthesis uh, of both the ideals of the Mexican Revolution and the ideas of socialism. Definitely in the case of, of Rivera and Siqueiros. Orozco is another animal altogether. Even though we know that Orozco was close very briefly to the Mexican Communist Party around 1923 or so, he quickly took his distance. I mean, his one known concrete political association is the Casa del Obrero Mundial and the anarcho-syndicalists. Uh, I think that Rivera, as Raquel Tibol has always said, is like the great chronicler of the ideals of the revolution uh, sort of recharge with a socialist perspective. Uh, he's always life affirming. He's always incredibly optimistic, uh, and I think it's fascinating that you know he completes uh, the final panel in the Palacio Nacional, uh, which of course you have this wonderful kind of archaeological view of the history of Mexico from from the time of the natives to the colonial period, independence, and then the revolution. You have this this allegorical view of the Aztec world, and then the other panel is El Futuro. And El Futuro is this wonderful view, aerial and part of Mexico, with Karl Marx, uh, like Moses, at the very top, uh, pointing to the future revolution. Uh, now, what I think is fascinating is the, the paradox here with both patronage uh, and the artist pushing the envelope, right? I mean, here he was able to do it, to get away with, in effect, uh, creating this Marxist allegory uh, on the walls of the presidential palace. Uh, there was still enough room, I think, at that time within Mexican politics. It was also, you know, the, the period of the, of the Popular Front. Uh, the Mexican government was very committed to the fight against fascism. It had been very supportive of the Spanish Civil War, uh, Republican side. Uh, so I think there you have Rivera managing to do it. Uh, I think Siqueiros does it uh, from the 20s, I think, until the early 40s. Uh, I think once he comes back to the fold, of, of the CP fully, wholeheartedly. I mean, I don't know how many of you know that he was thrown out in the early 30s. Uh, and I have to make sure I get my, my facts correct here because his niece is sitting in the front row. Uh, <laughs> and I'll be happy for her to, to add anything to this conversation. And then he did, he did not become, uh, you know, come back to the fold of the party until the 40s. Uh, he was perceived in the early 30s as a very uh, uncontrolled, a dynamic kind of revolutionary that was not doing what the party wanted him to do. Uh, and I think for him, the, the connection between the ideals of the revolution and his own 
very dynamic at that point interpretation of Marxism uh, is, is crystallized on two levels. Obviously, the work itself and this wonderful lecture that he gives in California called Pintura Dialectico Subversiva, where he basically says, look, the Soviet Union is pushing all this socialist, realist stuff. They don't know what they're doing. They're looking at most of representation grounded in 19th century academic painting. That's not socialism. Uh, socialism is to be as avant-garde as possible, to really turn forms around, to be as experimental as you can possibly be, not just with the content, but with the form. Don't you think it sounds a little bit like Trotsky? Uh, <laughs> that, I think, is a wonderful kind of paradox. Uh, and then, of course, he does this in, and, and I've always found this interesting about Siqueiros, that some would argue that he is, on the one hand, probably the, the most important uh, propagandizer. I like to be sarcastic and say he is the great evangelist of Mexican mural painting, because he <laughs> went all over the place, lecturing, promoting uh, the ideals of the Mexican uh, mural renaissance. But I think his easel paintings uh, in, in the 20s and 30s are incredible. I mean, I think they are sometimes much more revolutionary than the many things he will do later on in his career as a muralist. Uh, Orozco, he's non-aligned. He's full of piss and vinegar. I think if he believed in socialism, it probably lasted for about 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> but, and here's where I disagree with the interpretation of, for example, somebody who was a very dear friend of mine, uh, Schiffer Goldman. Schiffer Goldman and, interestingly enough, at another political point of view, Octavio Paz in his essay on Orozco says, Orozco is the painter of reaction, like Vasconcelos. Orozco is the farthest thing from a reactionary. Orozco is probably the, the most critical, uh, uncompromising spirit. I mean, everybody gets it. Orozco is what you would call an equal opportunity offender. He does, not, he does not romanticize the pre-Columbian past. He does not romanticize the colonial experience. And he sees the promises of the Mexican Revolution as something that has gone completely to pot. Uh, the fact that he's able to negotiate a mural program with that point of view tells us a great deal of what was going on in Mexico at that time. I mean, the murals in Guadalajara are incredibly misanthropic. Uh, the way he sees history, the way he sees the estate, they're amazing paintings. So he's definitely you know, an anarchist, a disillusioned anarchist, I would say, who ultimately, for him, social agency is only to be found in painting. To get back to, to your question, uh, going through my digressions, I think that Rivera and Siqueiros were able to reconcile or synthesize uh, the ideals of the revolution and the aspirations of socialism in the work of the 20s and 30s, without a doubt. And I think partly because of the way we've been reading their work throughout history, and the effects of what I mentioned briefly in my presentation, the effects of the construct imposed by the Cold War on how we read culture. Uh, we have tried to completely erase that great achievement. Uh, you know, I mean, today, the word socialism is anathema to anything for some people. Uh, obviously, those of us who are scholars of the 20s and 30s, it's not. Uh, but I think that's part of their great achievement, their ability to create this incredibly powerful modern visual vocabulary that was able to synthesize uh, and, and, and bring together the ideals of the Mexican Revolution and the aspirations of, of socialism. Yes, ma'am, yeah, and then. Um, both, uh, to, uh, for Professor Arreus, both uh, Path and Goldman, whom you just mentioned, uh, commented, commented quite a bit from what I read on something else that you mentioned, which was uh, Diego Rivera's return to Stalin. Mm -hmm. So here's a question that if you could just possibly fill me in on this. Seeing as at the period that Rivera really returns openly to Stalinism is just at the period when all of Stalin's atrocities are coming to light, and just at the period at which there really are other alternatives of Marxism that are becoming much more fertile and accepted, I, I, I may be asking you an impossible question, but why do you think it was then that he returned? You know, I could see him returning before the atrocities came to light. To return after all that, what is your opinion on that? I think it, it's, a, it's a very complicated uh, issue. And what I mean by complicated is that you, you have both the personal factors and, to a certain extent, his belief in what his public persona represented. Uh, so I think those two things sort of come together at that point. Uh, it's sad, really, uh, because you do understand that part of his way of getting, making his way back to, to Stalinism was also his embrace of, of Mao. Uh, uh, you know, one of his uh, a famous lost mural, which is a mural dealing with peace, uh, which was lost, by the way, in the People's Republic of China, 
uh, is this representation of Joseph Stalin and Mao offering Uncle Sam, John Bull, and Marianne a, a peace treaty to sign. Uh, I think at that point it was very much about the myth of who he was uh, and he also, and, and this I heard directly from, from the late Juan Ordman, he also used Frida Kahlo's return to the party as a way to get himself back into the party. Uh, you should know that he applied five times, reapplied five times, <laughs> and he was finally reaccepted on the fifth reapplication. Now, at the same time, because here's what I also find fascinating about Rivera. Rivera was very comfortable with being contradictory. Uh, and I think that's something to admire uh, in our day of clean-cut political correctness. He has this, you know, this controversy with the mural of the Alameda Central, where he paints a nigromante with a sign that says, God does not exist. You know, they close the mural. You know, he shows up with his friends. He opens the mural. He goes to the Soviet Union for treatment for cancer. He comes back goes back to the mural, changes the God does not exist, and instead puts part of a lecture that Anil Romante gave. Has, in typical Rivera fashion, a news conference, and says, uh, I've changed this because I'm still a communist, but I'm also a Catholic. <laughs> and I've had a conversation with my good friend Carlos Pellicer, the well-known Mexican poet and Catholic, uh, and I want to make sure that I respect the beliefs of the Mexican people. So he was very comfortable with, with those kinds of contradictions. Generally, I see it as a sign of, of decadence. I mean, it's really a very sad uh, final stage in his life. So. Yes, ma'am, you were. Yeah, I had a question. Um, towards the end of your presentation, um, Professor. Which, oh, Carlos, me? Okay. Yeah. Um, you had put in some you know, artists of the con contemporary within that legacy. Um, and I just had a question about like what your thoughts on your spark, um, the Social Public Art Research Center of Los Angeles that works uh, currently with the muralists. I just want to know how you felt they fit into that legacy because they were notably absent, and I think they're very. I involved. think they definitely fit into that legacy. Yeah, if you yeah if you could just like yeah yeah I just want to hear your thoughts on that. I guess I want to repeat. I'm sorry I missed the announcement of no questions. I thought it was an intimate enough environment. I just asked um, about the quote of uh, having called Rivera um, opportunistic. Cicados. Cicados, yeah, I'd like to... There's a certain point in his life. Yeah, well, which was kind of segueing into, you, you kind of already hit on that a little bit. Um, and then in addition to that, the important essay where you quoted uh, the author saying that, criticizing that movement as kind of ideological fetish, I'd like to uh, have you repeat that name because I'm very curious. To sure. Uh, the, the article was written by Jose Revueltas, who was the brother of both Fermín Revueltas, the muralist, and Silvestre Revueltas, okay. the great composer, a, an extraordinary... Uh, yeah. Mexican novelist and short story writer, and one of the most uh, lucid, in my view, and critical uh, Marxist uh, within Latin American literature. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an essay he published uh, in the 60s. What was it titled again? I will tell you, because when you get to be in your 50s, you get titles wrong. I'll give you the exact. It appeared in 1967, and the title is Escuela Mexicana de Pintura y Novela de la Revolución. But, uh, sorry. <laughs> Escuela Mexicana de Pintura mm -hmm. y Novela de la Revolución. He also, of course, analyzes the novel of the Mexican Revolution and all its, its contradictions, yes. uh, particularly looking back from, from the 60s. Yeah. Going back to your initial comment, I have not done an enormous amount of research or basically minimal research on the LA Collective that you mentioned, but I do know that they are a significant component of the continuation of that tradition and that they're very vital to what's going on. It's just that it's like Judy Bach is the main component of sure. that and her uh, collaborators, and so I noticed noticeably feminine presence a little absent. I just thought that was probably very oh, important. I have Marie Skirl in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> but keep in mind, you know, again, my, the, the point of my talk, I just wanted to be very, uh, give it a synopsis yeah. of, of some of the issues that are discussed uh, in the mural. Uh, but I do want to bring it back to Marie Skirl for a very important point. Keep in mind that that painting, uh, which I think is one of the most extraordinary easel paintings uh, in the history of not just Mexican art, uh, which is a still life with Red Snapper. I, I prefer the, the Spanish style. Naturaleza muerta con guachinango. That really gives you a taste of the fish. Yeah. <laughs> it's a profoundly poetic and political painting uh, because she does that painting in the 40s. And what you need to see in a work like that is the intense contradiction within that image. In the foreground is this splendorous, full still life. But the background is this very arid landscape, very dry and desolate. 
uh, and you see the, the, the power lines that are being set up. So there she's actually commenting in a very personal and poetic way on the still contradictions of Mexico as a developing country dealing with issues of poverty. Uh, the, the tension between the still life in the foreground and, and the emptiness of the landscape uh, in the back. Now, let me sort of, the final thing you wanted was my comment about Siqueiros. The um, opportunism, because I thought that was a very specific choice of word, and I was really curious to hear you elaborate on that, which you, you kind of, with the ideological fetish, I'm understanding a little better, but it would be interesting to hear your thoughts. It would be easier to use that term uh, without having to, to think about it too much with somebody like Rivera, particularly the way Rivera had no difficulty negotiating his patronage of the great, you know, the great leaders of American capitalism in the 1930s. <laughs> For me, the difficult thing with someone like Siqueiros is that no matter how many disagree with his Stalinism, Siqueiros put his money worth in Atlas. And what I mean by that, he served prison terms three times. Uh, he was under house arrest in Tasco. I mean, the guy believed it. So for me, what's disturbing is that at the end of his career, when he does the mural, The March of Humanity, he does it for a private patron who's building this hotel. Uh, and the connections between that patron and the Diaz Ordaz government and the person of Luis Echevarria are incredibly close. Mm -hmm. Of course, the massacre in Tatelorco has taken place. These are things that Siqueiros was a very politically savvy man, was very aware of. And yet, Siqueiros does not engage with those issues at all, and he just focuses on doing this project. Uh, and when, this project, when, when these issues are brought to his attention, he just puts them aside. And he says, you know, now here's what's interesting. He still is talking on one level as a, you know, as a believer in Marxist, but on the other level, he's saying, well, you know, this is an important mural, you know. This is patronage that I'm receiving, and this is why I have to do it. Uh, so that's what I find as, as opportunistic. And I'm sure, for me, it's most disturbing because you don't see that early in his career. Early in his career, you know, he put his money where his mouth was. That's interesting. Okay. Other questions? Or I, may I ask what? If you said, no, I'm, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm, you've touched on a couple of times, and it could be for, for both of you, uh, is actually the writing of the history of modern art and of, uh, of, of modernism and the, the arrival you know, of, of the Cold War, and in a certain sense, to rewrite the the preceding uh, preceding decades. Uh, I'll, I'll try a specific portal, but if that doesn't work, you can take it anywhere. The Rockefellers play a huge role in in all of this. The controversy is very well known about this, but the Rockefellers are also deeply involved in the Museum of Modern Art. Correct. Uh, and a place like the Museum of Modern Art uh, does a great deal to choose what you look at, uh, set canon, uh, et cetera. So uh, let me start with them, or do you want to take another path? Uh, with, to what degree is MoMA a player in all of, uh, of this? And uh, um, what are your comments about that, just opening up the topic? Do you want to answer first? <laughs> um, I'll start with just a, a brief anecdote. Uh, in, in 2000, MoMA did a symposium called American Drawing at Mid-Century. And for the first time, they decided to include Latin Americans. Now, interestingly enough, part of it had to do with the fact that a major trustee is a big collector of Armando Reveron's work, and Reveron, retrospective, was coming down the pike. So John Elderfield was invited to speak on Reveron's drawings. Uh, Larry Sims was invited to speak on Lam's drawings. And they invited me to speak about Cicado's drawings. And uh, I'm Cuban, so Cubans, we have an innate irreverent sense of humor. So when I got up to the podium, I looked up and I said, well, hi, David, you know, here I am. This is so uncomfortable to be talking about you in this place. Uh, and a couple of people got it, and of course, others yeah. were like, who is this, you know, <laughs> yeah. not saying yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, More choteo. But it's, exactly, <laughs> más choteo, como diría mañana. Uh, but I think it, the Rockefellers and MoMA play a, a key role. Now, you can say that the Rockefellers uh, there is many dimensions to them. For example, I don't know how many of you know that Abby Aldrich Rockefeller bought the first painting in the Sacco Vanzetti exhibition by Ben Shahn in 1932 in the downtown gallery, uh, which she then gave to MoMA. Uh, years later, she was asked, why did you do this, Mrs. Rockefeller? She said, well, when the revolution comes, I want to put it on our front window so they don't burn down the house of Rockefeller. <laughs> they were smart enough to understand Keep this in mind, MoMA was in 1929. They were smart enough to understand right away 
And this was in part not just Barr, but also people like Lincoln Kernstein, the presence of Edgar Kaufman Jr. Uh, they were smart enough to understand that there was an avant-garde in Latin America. Uh, and from the very beginning, they acknowledged it. So Batista's his first, the first retrospective after MoMA opens in 1930. The second one in 1931 is Diego Rivera. That narrative is something the Rockefellers are perfectly comfortable with. And of course comes the issue with Rivera and the Rockefeller mural in 33. The mural is torn down. But just so you, you see the contradictions, while that mural was being destroyed in New York, Abby Olders Rockefeller was paying for Orozco to complete the Dartmouth Baker Library murals. <laughs> and 10 years later, in 1943, Nelson Rockefeller pays for Siqueiros in Cuba to do a mural called Dos Cumbres de America, depicting Lincoln and Jose Martí. So they were still able to negotiate back and right. forth within that realm. But I definitely believe that after 1948, there is a deliberate distancing, right. and you can see that all of a sudden, the MoMA publications, who are the Latin Americaners that they're promoting? They're promoting Tamayo, they're promoting Mata, they're promoting Wilfredo Ram, they're promoting Torres Garcia, those that are more easily aligned with an international avant-garde that fits with a larger post, uh, you know, Cold War uh, structure. So definitely, uh, you know, a role has been played. And I can tell you, I remember my, my first textbook as an undergrad of modern art. Uh, there was barely a mention <coughs> of the muralist. And I asked my professor, and she said, oh, they did some big paintings you know, down in Mexico. <laughs> and you know, they had some influence in the 1930s here, but it's not that relevant anymore. OK, that's not what I heard. Uh, <laughs> but now you can look at that same textbook, which of course now, you know, the initial author passed away, I don't know how many decades ago. There's at least, not enough in my view, but there's at least three and a half pages <laughs> uh, dealing with the work of Orozco, Siqueiro, Rivera, and Frida Kahlo, and occasionally you see also Tamayo. Okay. We've got maybe one more question, because I think that, that, that we come to an hour and a half. Jennifer, would you like to comment on that at all? For me, when thinking about the, the writing of the history of Mexican art or the right. writing of art history, it's, it's a, for this project, I'm dealing with a different set of expectations about which story and which narrative should be told. Um, so with this project, what I'm so interested in is how it is that, as I'm suggesting, the center of Cardenas's artistic program is articulated in this town of 8,000 people in Michoacan, right? And it has um, you know, sculpture by the leading modernist sculptures of the period, murals by a huge number of different muralists. And I didn't even show you all of them. I just gave you a select number of them. We have films being filmed here. Everybody who's anybody in the, ter in the, in the panorama of intellectuals and artists come to visit Pascuaro and get a retreat. When Pratsky and um, Diego and Breton are writing their revolutionary manifesto, they're, in pa they're doing it in Pazcuero, right? That's the spot where everybody goes during this period. It is the center of things, and yet you, it's a, you, know, you don't hear it. Um, so the narrative that I'm dealing with and trying to rethink is how we talk about what is happening in Mexican art outside of Mexico City. And there are all sorts of historical reasons that we focus on Mexico City. Um, but those are constructed reasons, right? They're not, they're not just inherent, right? Um, and part of it has to do with that's where you, if you want to go and research Mexican art, that's where you do your research. That's where the archives are, right? That's, that's where the um, universities that focus on modern Mexican art are. If you look at the universities in Michoacan, they're talking about colonial art. They're not doing modern. So it has to do with how the institutional structures of Mexican art are established. And you don't get anything outside of Mexico City in that context. So I'm dealing with a different set of, of narratives and trying to rethink them. The other thing, but he was, but he was from Cardenas. Well, and that's the interesting was thing. That, right, because the, the reality of Mexico in the 20s and the 30s is incredible migration. Right, people are going you know, to Mexico City for, to study art, 
but then they're getting sent back out again and circulating. And so movement and circulation and travel. When Rivera gets back to Mexico, he's sent to travel um, in order to make his, his work more Mexican. So the idea that you have to travel and you have to experience all these different regions, and in fact, everybody's from all these different regions. And there, this, there is this incredible back and forth between politicians and intellectuals from Michoacan and Mexico City. Um, so that's an incredibly important nexus. But those narratives, that regional narrative is never told. So that's the, that's the twist I'm trying to deal with. Well, I think we, we've come to a, a nice sort of point of, of, of closure. And let's thank our two speakers. For that. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank both you. Thank you.